The relationship between ancient Rome and China is a fascinating one. Today, we'll be analyzing the accuracy of an ancient Chinese historian's account of the Roman Empire. For the original text and voiceover, definitely watch this video from the channel Voices from the Past, which truly makes you feel like a Chinese emperor hearing about the wonders at the end of the world. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. As an introduction of the text, we'll run through the quick who, what, where, when, why. So the who. The text was written by Yu Huan, a prominent Chinese official known for producing many volumes of historical work. While these mainly focused on the accounts of Chinese dynasties of his era, Yu Huan also wrote about the information he collected regarding the lands beyond his far eastern homeland. The what? Well, the title of the text translates to A Brief Account of Wei. It was apparently a massive, 50-volume work recounting the history of the Kingdom of Wei. Unfortunately though, the full text has been lost to history, and we only have any records of it at all thanks to other Chinese authors who quoted it. The passage we'll be talking about today is just one such fragment from the specific chapter entitled Peoples of the West. This chapter is then broken down into further sections addressing a variety of kingdoms and travel details, with an author's note at the end. Here are the sections related to Dachin, or Rome. As you can see, some cover its territory, its customs, its products, its trade routes, and its dependencies. So now the where. Well, the title of the work gives us a clue. It comes from the Wei Dynasty, one of the three kingdoms which had emerged from the fall of the Han Empire in the middle 200s AD. Yu Huan was born around the region of the former capital of Chang'an, and eventually became mayor of the Wei capital of Luoyang at one point before settling down to write his book. The when is, well, our best guess is somewhere around the time frame of 250 AD. However, the contents of what is recorded within would have come from a variety of previous sources we mentioned, which were trickling in over the centuries. One specific mention in the text does call out a supposed merchant from Rome who visited it in the fifth year of the Huangwu period of the reign of Sun Quan, so basically 226 AD. The why. Well, books like this were actually quite common in ancient China, and often came about when a dynasty would establish an official office to write the history of its predecessor. Here's a list of the major Chinese works spanning the centuries of dynastic rule. Often, these would overlap with one another and list other texts as references. In our case, it seems that the author Yu Huan was involved in an effort to legitimize the Wei Kingdom in its contests for supremacy following the fall of the Han. Now, let's finally turn to examining the merits of the description of ancient Rome. We'll basically move line by line to say if it's true, false, or unclear, whilst also providing commentary. So let's get started. The relevant sections begin by giving the general location of Da Qin. The kingdom of Da Qin, also called Li Jian, was west of Angxi and Tiaoxi, and west of a big sea. Sounds good so far when you translate the name places. He then goes on to contextualize the geography for his eastern audience by laying out some of the more commonly known locations. After the frontier of Angxi, you take a boat from the city of Anggu and cut directly across to Haixi. With favorable winds, it takes two months. If the winds are slow, perhaps a year. If there is no wind, perhaps three years. So the directions listed here are decent, but the timing really isn't. There is some small truth here though when he mentions that the winds were a big factor. And this is all because trade across the Indian Ocean was subject to the seasonal monsoons. And you have to time your journey just right to catch these and make your way across. So for instance, winter winds would take you west and summer winds would take you east. And if you wrote it just right, this would take you maybe about a month or two. But if you missed it, you'd have to wait for another six to nine months before trying again. And after this, you'd then have to take another few weeks to travel up the Red Sea to Alexandria. The three-year extreme claimed by the Chinese historian seems a bit excessive, but perhaps maybe he spoke to some merchants who were lackadaisical and took their time traveling between various ports. Anyways, once in Egypt, you can then start to poke around the Western world. The country that you reach is west of the sea, which is why it is called Haixi. There is a river flowing out of the west of this country, and then there is another big sea. The city of Wuchisan is in Haixi. 
This description here gives a super high level, and again, a very vague description of Egypt, with the Nile flowing down into the Mediterranean, whereupon it finds the city of Alexandria. The text then backtracks a little bit to that original border town in Parthia to describe an alternate overland route. Now, if you leave the city of Angu by the overland route, you go north to Hai Bay, then west to Hai Shi, then turn south to go through the city of Wuchisan. The route here being described was likely one of the many Silk Road passages linking through Persia, Mesopotamia, and into the Roman provinces of Syria, Judea, Arabia, and eventually Egypt. After crossing a river which takes a day by boat, you circle around the coast. From there, six days is generally enough to cross another big sea to reach that country, Da Chin. This here is extremely vague, but most likely refers to traveling to Cyrene. From here, he says it then takes about six days to cross the second great sea to finally reach Da Chin. This is relatively accurate once again, but checking the awesome Stanford journey calculator, this leg of the trip would actually take closer to about a week just to get to Sicily, and then another four to five days to get to Rome, so basically double his, uh, his quoted figure. But in any case, let's say that we've now made it, using these extremely loose directions. So what can be said about Da Chin? This country, Da Chin, has more than 400 smaller cities and towns. It extends several thousand li in all directions. So this description here is definitely shortchanging the scope and scale of the empire at this point, which covered most of the Mediterranean. And using this online map tool, you can definitely see that in Italy alone, there's like basically thousands of cities and towns. So yeah, I missed out a little bit. The king's seat of government is close to the mouth of a river. The outer walls of the city are made of stone. Well, uh, I guess this is a pretty decent description of ancient Rome, but it could just as well describe any other major city in the world. The king's administrative capital is more than 100 li around. There is an official department of archives. Now we're getting a bit more specific, though the 42 kilometer circumference quoted is monstrously large, and in reality the walls of Rome were closer to something like, uh, I believe it's like 10 to 15 kilometers around. As for the Department of Archives bit, I don't really think you could say Rome had a specific department for that, as one might see in the more heavily bureaucratic Chinese government, but certainly there were many repositories for public and private records present. The ruler of this country is not permanent. When disasters result from unusual phenomena, they unceremoniously replace him, installing a virtuous man as king and release the old king, who does not dare show resentment. So this bit here strikes me as a little bit odd, uh, and it has kind of a distant echo of earlier Rome, where the consuls were elected on an annual basis to serve as the heads of state. However, by the time this historian is writing, you know, the Republic is long gone, we're in the age of the Emperor, and here the only real transfer of power would take place by succession or by force of arms. The king has five palaces at ten li intervals. He goes out at daybreak to one of the palaces and deals with matters until sunset and then spends the night there. The next day he goes to another palace and in five days makes a complete tour. Again, this bit here isn't really accurate. Emperors did not have a fixed rotating schedule between five palaces. Uh, whilst in Rome, they would stay basically where they pleased. Now this might be within one of several palaces, maybe even some that they had built. Uh, but it might also be some smaller private dwellings or even villas that were located outside the city. Emperors could also make a habit, particularly in the later years or during years of civil war, of traveling out to be closer to the troops on campaign. We then get an attempt of explaining the Roman system of government. When the king goes out for a walk, he always orders a man to follow him, holding a leather bag. Anyone who has something to say throws his or her petition into the bag. When he returns to the palace, he examines them and determines which are reasonable. So yeah, this definitely was not a common practice at any point in Roman history. However, what may be going on here 
is that sometimes the emperors and politicians would put on propaganda stunts to win the support of the people, so perhaps this description here is a long, passed down legend of one such occurrence. They have appointed 36 leaders or generals who discuss events frequently. If one leader does not show up, there is no discussion. This talk of 36 leaders sounds a bit like they're trying to mention the Senate, though the real Senate numbered in like the hundreds, and I wouldn't really call them leaders when the Emperor reigned, as they had lost much of their institutional power since the days of the Republic. And the mention of all 36 leaders being required to run a meeting is also wrong, since the Roman Senate never really required a quorum of everyone in attendance. You know, they did have a quorum that varied from time to time, but it was never the full count of everyone being present. Uh, but anyways, next we move on to discussing Da Qin more broadly. This region has pine trees, cypress, sophora, catalpa, bamboo, reeds, poplars, willows, parasol trees, and, and all sorts of plants. The people cultivate the five grains, and they raise horses, mules, donkeys, camels, and silkworms. Most of these seem about right, but you know, for instance, the mention of bamboo and silkworms do definitely stand out as being out of place. Um, and actually, when it comes to silkworms in particular, these were a uh, pretty closely guarded eastern secret, and they wouldn't be farmed in the west in significant quantities for quite some time. Though apparently there are some accounts of people from the west uh, during this period and later trying to smuggle these precious silkworms out. Um, so yeah, that's a little anecdote for you. They have a tradition of amazing conjuring. They can produce fire from their mouths, bind, and then free themselves and juggle 12 balls with extraordinary skill. Okay, so this next one sounds... yeah, I mean, I guess there were crazy performers to be found in the Roman Empire, but I'm not sure I'd vouch for Rome's ability to conjure things, though that would probably make it a bit easier to explain their rise to power. The common people are tall and virtuous, like the Chinese, but wear Hu clothes. They say they originally came from China, but left it. Okay, yeah, let's call BS here. Whoever the historian talked to for this one uh, was on something, or perhaps, you know, what's more likely is that this mindset comes from the idea that the Chinese naturally saw themselves as the center of the world, you know, as anyone would, and thus foreigners must have some point originated from them. And you know, the strong and powerful Romans especially must be related to us, the strong and powerful Chinese. The laymen can read or write Hu script. This uh, portion here, while generally true, again doesn't tell us much about which specific language they employ, be it, you know, Greek or Latin, which were both prevalent. And while ancient literacy rates are difficult to judge, most likely your general commoner would be on the low end of literacy with some basic functional ability to read and write, but it's not something that would have been like super common and super um, uh, well-educated, you know. They have multi-storied public buildings and private. They fly flags, beat drums, uh, travel in small carriages with white roofs, and have a, a postal service with relay sheds and postal stations, like in the Middle Kingdom. So this bit here is definitely uh, an eclectic little description that has some stuff ranging from the generic to the specific. So for starters, well, just about everyone had flags and drums, but the, the two-story buildings remark does whittle things down a little bit to more architecturally advanced societies like Rome. And small carriages mentioned here might make reference to something like a litter used to carry around elites, or perhaps even wagons that were used for long travel. The postal service here mentioned at the end is accurate in that the Romans definitely had a mailing system, but it wasn't necessarily unique to them. And not only were there tons of postal stations established along major roads, but there was also a whole assortment of professional letter carriers and couriers used by people like Julius Caesar and Cicero and other politicians throughout the years. From Angxi, you go around High Bay to reach this country. There are no bandits or thieves, but there are fierce tigers and lions that kill those traveling on the route. If you are not in a group, you cannot get through. 
This next bit describing, you know, the eastern side of the Roman Empire sounds like some interesting flavor text you might find at the beginning of like a D&D &D adventure or something, uh, but it doesn't really reflect reality. You know, of course there would have been bandits in places uh, around the Roman world, and especially in the east when you look during the civil wars or the breakdown of the third century, you know, the crisis of the third century when things start to fracture. Uh, yeah, I'd probably say you have more to fear when it came to people than lions and tigers claimed by this historian. This country has installed dozens of minor kings. They divide the various branch principalities of their territory into small countries, such as that of the King of Jisan, uh, the King of Lufen, the King of Kielan, the King of Xiandu, the King of Sifu, and that of the King of Yuluo. There are so many other small kingdoms, it is impossible to give details on each one. So this little summary here is okay in the sense that it calls out the subdivisions present in Roman administration. However, it seems to focus mainly on smaller kingdoms rather than the far more important, you know, province structure of the empire. Yet coming from the east and, uh, you know, where this historian's sources were likely operating, uh, there would have been a lot of these buffer regions between Rome and Parthia and later the Sassanids, so it's not necessarily that surprising that the main focus here is on these kind of smaller kingdoms with the term being bandied about. And especially if you're going to be once again visiting during the crisis of the 3rd century, uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of fracturing to talk about and allegiances. So yeah, it's a little bit excusable there, especially when you draw some analogs over to the Chinese world. Um, this kind of talk of kingdoms is something that they would have been familiar with. So yeah, I mean, after this, the uh, the text does go on. We get a long parade of products that are listed coming out of Rome. I won't necessarily comment on this too much other than to say that, yep, I mean, basically true. There were indeed a huge number of goods passing through the Roman Empire, much of these being circulated from all around the known world. Uh, the historian here does again call out the idea that there was silk present. And yes, Romans traded in silk a lot, but there wasn't too much domestic production of it, at least in this era, which, like I said, you know, later... Uh, when silkworms get stolen or imported or whatever, later production does increase, but for the time being, it's mostly a commodity that's going to be imported. Uh, and then after this, we do get a list of Roman dependencies, which end up being mostly, once again, you know, eastern city-focused around Parthia. And then we also have some comments about an alternate trade route uh, south around Vietnam, which, uh, you know, if we look at history, Romans were actually operating, at least the merchants, all the way out in Vietnam, which you never really think about. I mean, they went so far, some of them uh, in North Africa, diving really, really deep. All kinds of interesting stuff that I'd love to discuss in future videos. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more interesting gems to be picked out of the text as you continue to read. But for now, I think we'll wrap things up as we've covered the bulk of it. So I hope you enjoyed this analysis of Roman-Chinese relationships. It's truly a super fascinating topic, especially when one imagines what it would have looked like from the ground level to go beyond your little corner of the world and explore the unknown. And especially when you look at our modern age, where we so rarely get to experience this sense of exploration, there's definitely a longing for it. But I do have to say, you can catch and kind of rekindle this mesmerizing experience by checking out the original video that prompted this, well, this commentary. Uh, they do an excellent job at, like I said, putting you the, in the perspective of that Chinese emperor and seeing the world in a whole fresh set of eyes, exploring it once new. So definitely highly recommend that video. And again, a huge thanks to Pete and David from uh, Voice of the Past for their fantastic work. And also a shout out to the translator that they used, uh, John E. Hill. And he's going to be the one who I said, you know, translated this ancient Chinese account and made both of our videos possible. I'd like to thank NordVPN for sponsoring our video. They help protect your privacy online through encryption services hosted on over 5,000 fast servers located in 60 countries. Using NordVPN allows you to protect your data while out in public or while traveling and can help you unlock entertainment sites like Netflix from wherever you are in the world, be it Europe or China. A subscription allows you to have up to six simultaneous connections with double data encryption for increased anonymity and a CyberSec suite, which serves as an automatic ad blocker. They've got 24 seven customer support and a 30 day money back guarantee. It is my duty though, as a responsible influencer, to inform you that there has been a recently disclosed attack on NordVPN that has since been contained. The incident involved a single server and not the entire service, and investigations have revealed that no user credentials were affected or were at risk, and no attempts were made to monitor traffic. And NordVPN has continued to tout its commitment to constantly improving user security, though I'd urge you to seek out accurate reporting on this affair before taking any action. 
If after doing so you feel this is the right fit for you, then sign up today and get NordVPN 70% off by going to nordvpn.com slash Invicta. Plus, for Cyber Month, you get an additional two months free if you check it out. Thank you all for watching, and thanks again to all of our patrons as well as our researchers, writers, artists, and editors as always. If you like this video, check out our related content about the fascinating past and be sure to like and subscribe. See you in the next one.